Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 242 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Delaware has a really interesting past. It was the ancestral home of the Lenape and Anticoke peoples. In the 17th century, these Native Americans were joined by European settlers who came from Sweden, the Netherlands, England, and other European countries. Now, these settlers crossed the Atlantic because they wanted to trade with Native Americans and establish new homes among Delaware's rich forests, lush soils, and large coastline. In fact, to really understand Delaware and its past, we must look at its geography. Delaware is located on both the Appalachian Piedmont and the Atlantic Coastal Plain. These two regions are really distinctive, and both have played important roles in the development of Delaware's long agricultural traditions and its dual identities as both the Northern and Southern Territory. Plus, Delaware also holds the distinction of being the first state in the United States. Now, all of this really means we need to take some time to get to know Delaware and its early American past better, which is why we'll be joined by David Young. David Young is the executive director of the Delaware Historical Society. It's an organization with a stated mission to preserve, explore, share, and promote Delaware's rich history, heritage, and culture. So as we make our way to and through Delaware's early American past, David reveals the work of the Delaware Historical Society and its public historians, details about the Native American peoples of Delaware and their first encounters with Europeans, and how and why Delaware developed dual identities as both a northern and southern colony and state. But first, just a reminder that this coming Saturday, June 15, is our Pittsburgh meetup. We're going to meet up at 2.30 p.m. at the Porch Restaurant. Now, you'll find all the details you need for this meetup, plus a place where you can RSVP for it, at benfranklinsworld.com meetup. I can't wait to see you soon. Okay, are you ready to explore the work of the Delaware Historical Society and the early history of Delaware? Let's go meet our guest historian. Joining us is the executive director of the Delaware Historical Society. He has served as the executive director of Cliveden, a historic site of the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Germantown, Pennsylvania, and is the first director of the Johnson House, a national historic landmark that's on the Underground Railroad and also in Germantown. In addition to this work, our guest has also published books and articles on the Underground Railroad and on historic site sustainability, including his forthcoming book, The Battles of Germantown, Effective Public History in America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, David Young. Thanks for having me. Good to talk with you, Liz. Now, David, you have quite the extensive career and experience working as a public historian. So, Would you tell us about the work public historians do? Sure. One way to think about public history is how to make the scholarly rigor of historians relevant to broad publics and to really embrace the public nature of how people want to know about the past. It means explaining intricacies and contradictions of history to non-experts and in ways that give life to history, whether through education, through inviting people into the investigations that historians take, such as archaeology or archival work, and also by making these things broadly relevant. It means bringing people along with more than one simple vision of the past in order to get funding or gain resources, and it invites participation in the historical process. I think a couple of examples would be helpful here. So would you tell us about one or two of the ways that you've given life to history and invited people inside the historical process? Certainly. One of the best ways is to really try to make the engagement with the past an experience. But public history in many ways involves four things. It must be scholarship-based. It must be collaborative. It must do a public service and be of an immediate need think of it as applying historical understanding to the present. So one of the things that in my own research in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia, where I worked for many years, 
1928, there was a public history experience called Negro Achievement Week as one of the three first African-American history weeks that later became Black History Month. And it was done in a broad collaboration among leaders of the YWCA, the YMCA, and the Black YMCA and the Black YWCA, as well as racially exclusive institutions like Cheney State Teachers College and the Quaker Friends Meeting, none of whom really worked together before, but they brought leaders of the Harlem Renaissance to Germantown in 1928 for a week-long celebration of African-American literary and artistic achievement, including with history. And it was people like Elaine Locke and W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson who came to this neighborhood in Philadelphia. And for a week, people looked at the contributions of African-Americans in American life and letters. And it involved many things, concerts, speeches, art in store windows, in largely segregated sections of the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia. And the reason people did this in a neighborhood that was not known for collaboration and was really known for its colonial preservation efforts, here they were celebrating African-American life and letters in the early 20th century. And they did it because of the large presence of the Ku Klux Klan in the neighborhood at the time. So in a way, it was to apply a history in broad public ways to examine things together in order to face a compelling need at the time, which is one of the descendant groups was burning crosses on Cliveden Street. So Germantown had a large membership, the largest membership of the Klan in the city of Philadelphia of any neighborhood. So here they brought all these national leaders. The year before, it had been in Chicago, and the year before that, it had been in New York on Michigan Avenue in Chicago and on Park Avenue in New York. Here it was in the Germantown neighborhood because of that pressing need. So the other aspect of that is that was research that I found in the files of the YWCA. And like many public history programs, they evaluated it. They talked to people who attended the programs for the week. Nearly 4,000 people attended these programs in Germantown in 1928 at various venues to hear Du Bois speech, for instance. But no one knew about it. And in a neighborhood of Germantown, where there are seven national historic landmarks and many well-preserved buildings run by organizations like the National Trust or the National Park Service, no one had heard of this event, this week-long event, this first modern public history program in America until 2008. And we reenacted it in 2011 involving Germantown high school students and Germantown Friends School students. And we reenacted it in a way that celebrated the Harlem Renaissance and considered ways that it applies to the neighborhood. You know, this was in 2011. But it reveals the many layers of public history, that it's research, it's collaborative, it gets people out of their own specific way of understanding the past to consider different perspectives and to inform the present situation. So it's an example of public history from the past that we also tried to apply in the 21st century in a compelling way. And then even though it was brief, it was a really effective public history experience. That's one of many examples. When Cliveden reenacts the Battle of Germantown, for instance, it attracts 6,000 people to Germantown for an opportunity to see hundreds of reenactors take over the streets of Germantown and attack Cliveden. The Chu House, the Chu Mansion, that was the teeth of the fighting in October of 1777 of a battle that involved 21,000 troops. And the, the reenactment is a very popular event. It's taken place since 1977. And the question that people would utter most often at the reenactment was, really? This really happened? So it's an example to bring life to history, to the research, to the ongoing discovery about events from the past to a broad public. And it can be a social way as well. You know, we don't know enough of what we want to know about the past. And public history allows us to learn from one another from the different perspectives, because history depends on where you're standing. So to get from other perspectives, different glimpses of how folks are understanding what happened allows us to learn more about the past than we might simply by reading a book or simply by being in the classroom.
Yeah, it definitely sounds like public history is a way to bring communities into the historical process and into situations where people can learn from one another. And from my research, it seems like the Delaware Historical Society has its roots in community involvement and in trying to convey and develop a sense of the history of Delaware. Could you tell us more about the Delaware Historical Society and the work it does along those lines? Yes. Well, the Delaware Historical Society was founded in 1864 in part because there was no such organization in the state. And places like Pennsylvania had founded a historical society in 1824, Maryland in 1844. And in 1864, people got together in part because there was no way to remember the colonial heritage, the artifacts from the times, the buildings that were still there. And it was an effort to preserve and document the past. The first professional director of the society at, in Delaware was in 1962, so it's only been professionalized relatively recently. And in that 100-year or so interim, the society has saved historic buildings like Old Town Hall. It has saved buildings like the Reed House, which is in Newcastle, an 1804 National Historic Landmark that's owned by the Delaware Historical Society. And right now we have nine adapted buildings. My museum is in an old Woolworths, and the society brought that into its collection in the 1980s. Across the street from the museum in the old Woolworths is a 1930 Art Deco bank that houses our research library and archives. And next to it are four buildings that were saved during the highway construction and saved from demolition in the 1960s and 70s, and those are four colonial buildings. All these were community efforts to gain the resources, to save the buildings, to catch buildings that might have been lost, to preserve by last resort in the case of the four colonial buildings in Wellingtown Square, to relocate them so that we could activate those buildings. So I'll give you an example from one of those buildings, which is the Cox House, We are actively working with the Jewish Historical Society of Delaware, whose collections are in our library's basement. We're going to activate the Cox House to be the home of the Jewish Historical Society and have a more street-level presence on Market Street, where many Jewish business owners establish the commercial downtown of Wilmington here on South Market Street that eventually became the commercial hub of Wilmington in the DuPont era and the commercial era of credit cards and financial institutions. So the origins of that are right now in the basement in our archives, and we'll be bringing them up and activating a colonial building to give more public access and program opportunity for the public to engage with that history. So that's one of many examples. We also have the Mitchell Center for African American Heritage in the Delaware Historical Society which is both an exhibition space with a theater that is really dynamic with interactive displays and video about the African-American history, the five centuries of the African-American history in Delaware, right up to the present day, including the occupation of Wilmington by the National Guard in 1968 after riots from April. The governor installed a nine-month occupation in Wilmington. So we really explore the heritage and its implication right up to the recent memory. But we examine very carefully the Underground Railroad history of Delaware and the uh, heritage of colonial plantation economy in Delaware, which is an extremely important topic in its history with many implications. It certainly sounds like Delaware has a lot of history, a rich history to explore, and I think we should explore some of its early history. Now, at the Delaware Historical Society, there's an ongoing exhibition called One State, Many Stories. And the goal of this exhibition is to provide an overview of the state's history from the 1600s to the present. So, David, Connie would like to know when and how the story of Delaware begins. So, would you tell us about the state's Native American origins and past? Certainly. The original inhabitants of the Brandywine Valley were an Algonquin Indian tribe who called themselves the Lenape which was their word for common people. And the Lenape were in the Brandywine, the northern section of Delaware, and in the southern sections of what are now Kent and Sussex counties, were the Nanticoke. And the Nanticoke means people of the tidewaters. Their way of life centered upon the Chesapeake Bay 
And culturally, they were very similar to the Lenape, whom they considered their elder kinfolk. Both groups used the land for hunting and farming, and they were also skilled at making clothes. They were matrilineal culture, and the kinship was based on the female lineage. So these folks, in effect, became expert hunters, farmers, and fishermen, and they became very adept at trade with the Europeans. Speaking of trade with Europeans, Marie wonders when the Lenape and the Nanticoke began to encounter Europeans in Delaware, and why some of those Europeans chose to settle in Delaware. Those are a couple of very good questions. The first contact we know of was in 1608. Captain John Smith sailed into the Chesapeake Bay as the Nanticokes watched from the woods, and Smith got a little too close to the coast and was sent a few warning arrows. The next day, the Nanticokes took a more open stance and arrived on shore, but the Europeans arrived in the Delaware Bay searching for trading opportunities to make money on goods. They shipped back to Europe. The Kalmar Nickel was one of the first interactions from the Europeans coming specifically to the Delaware Bay. The early settlements were primarily trading posts, fur trade, which at the time was almost a European obsession, and the native tribes were very skillful at providing the fur. Before Penn sailed into the Delaware Bay in the 1660s, the first settlement in Delaware by Europeans was in Zwanendel in 1631. There was the Dutch presence in Wilmington in 1655. Earlier, they'd been in what is now Lewis in the 1630s. The Dutch had bought the land from the Lene Lenape, but they complained to some others about it, and it was essentially a miscommunication of language. And the Dutch, many of them were killed in a revenge attack from native tribes near Zwanendel. So that didn't last as long as the first permanent settlement, which is by the Swedes in 1638, and that was later stolen away by the Dutch in 1655. In many ways, the Dutch and the Swedish became very brief settlers in the Delaware, and they had a long-lasting impact, even though their settlements were relatively brief. I'm really glad you mentioned the Swedes, because at least outside of the Mid-Atlantic, it really seems to be a little-known fact that Sweden established a colony in North America. So would you tell us a bit more about why the Swedes sought to establish a colony in North America and more about its colony, New Sweden? Well, best that I can say is that I always like to think that the Swedes were here until they got bitten by their first mosquitoes and greenheads in the bay. But before the Dutch, the Swedish came in in 1638. They had come over on a couple of ships. One was called the Kalmar Nickel and the other the Fogel Grip. They arrived looking for these trading opportunities. And Peter Minuet, then representing the Swedish crown, founded the first permanent European colony. And they called it New Sweden. Minuet's probably best known for purchasing Manhattan Island. But he was employed at the time by the Dutch West India Company. Years later, while representing the Swedish crown, he had come to Delaware. So there's some confusion because sometimes he worked for both the Dutch West India Company and later the Swedes. But under Minuet, they established Fort Christina. They quickly built Fort Christina and named it for the Queen at the time. And then the director of New Netherland, as Minuet had been, became Peter Stuyvesant. The Dutch ousted the Swedes and built their own fort near Fort Christina, which they called New Amstel, which is in present-day Newcastle, and it's still a very well-preserved area. But, you know, it failed in part because Sweden didn't offer adequate support for the colony. The colonists had used the land and the forests, and they built log cabins and farmed the land. They traded with the natives for furs, and then they sold those back. But the colony of New Sweden only lasted 17 years. They depended on Sweden for manufactured goods like metals, guns and gunpowder, and goods to trade with the Native Americans for fur. But they never got the support they deserved. And when Sweden found itself in a war with Denmark, its ships were diverted back to the continent for military needs. And when the queen assumed control at age 18, she showed no interest in the colony. At one point, New Sweden's governor did not hear from Sweden, did not get supply ships for over six years. Okay, so this colony was relatively short-lived, but what was it about New Sweden that attracted potential settlers? Colonists went to New England for religion and to New Netherland for farming and trade, but 
What brought them to New Sweden? Well, they wanted to have a stronghold before the Dutch who had already claimed the land. But let's be clear, the Delaware Peninsula, the Delmarva Peninsula, is some of the richest land, and it's also on the coast. So it presents itself for fortifications in very rich territory. Its silty soil provides great farming and timber. The northern parts of Delaware are well forested. They later became really prime areas for gunpowder factories. And further south, that's rich soil for foodstuffs, but also later tobacco and wheat and other kinds of farming right there on the coast at the ocean of a peninsula that then is not far from other forts in New Amsterdam or further south in what's now known as Maryland. It was less founded for religious reasons than military and trading. Now, what did the Lenape and the Nanticoke peoples think of the Swedish and Dutch colonists who settled in their homelands? It sounds like the Europeans possibly afforded them the chance to trade with different empires, but what did these Native Americans make of their new neighbors? The Lenape are indigenous, and you know their historical territory had been present-day New Jersey, mid to northern Delaware, eastern Pennsylvania. They were often taken advantage of in land purchases. And this was also exacerbated by intertribal conflicts. And they made of it in some ways that they could work well with both the Swedish and the Dutch. But upon you know, some of the contact, there were language barriers that did not necessarily help further existing relations to the good of the Lenape. You know, there were lasting impacts, things like you might not be aware of, like Wawa, the well-known food chain comes from the Lenape word for Canadian geese, which dot the area in droves. So in some ways, what the Native Americans were getting out of the Dutch and the Swedish was temporary and opportunistic and not long-lasting. So we know from our conversation that Swedish governance of Delaware was supplanted by Dutch governance of Delaware. And we know from other episodes that in 1664, the English would supplant Dutch governance in North America with its conquest of New Netherland. Now, when we talk about the conquest of New Netherland, we often just talk about how New Netherland became New York. But as you just mentioned, David, New Netherland encompassed more than just New York. It encompassed New Jersey and Delaware, too. So after we talk about our episode sponsor, I wonder if you would take us through what the English conquest of New Netherland meant for Delaware. The Lenape, the Nanticoke, the Swedish, the Dutch, the English. Delaware may be a small state, but it has a big, diverse, and complex history, don't you think? Of course, this makes a lot of sense, right? Because early America is a period filled with big, complex histories, even when the subjects might appear to be small. This is why in each episode, the Omohundro Institute and I bring you interesting histories about a diverse array of topics. We want to help you better make sense of the historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. Now, this podcast is possible because of the support we give each other. The Omohundro Institute and I help you explore the early American past through great historical scholarship. And in turn, we rely on you to listen and to help spread the word about the show and all its ideas. And now, you can help us spread the word even further and show the world that you're Ben Franklin's world fan and listener because we have t-shirts, tote bags, and hoodies in our brand new Ben Franklin's World store. Visit benfranklinsworld.com shop and you'll find a couple of great designs. And any day now, you'll also find a couple of limited edition designs to help you commemorate and celebrate the 4th of July. Plus, you can feel good about any of the purchases you make from the Ben Franklin's World shop because each item you purchase generates some funds to help support the podcast. So visit benfranklinsworld.com shop and order your new and limited edition Ben Franklin's World t-shirts, tote bags, and hoodies today. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash shop. David, what did the English conquest of New Netherland in 1664 mean for Delaware? It meant a number of things, including different kinds of faith networks that came in by way of the English. So there were far more Quakers and Methodists that came in to Delaware after 1664, after the English took over the Dutch possessions which, by the way, is only then when the area became known as Delaware. So the English not only got the forts, but they also got an opportunity to populate the region separate from the Dutch areas of northern New Jersey or separate from some of the other settlers in various areas like the Huguenots from France in New York. So 
to some degree, the British really were just extending their empire to the larger region and the rich region of fishing and timber and various kinds of fuels like prehistoric cedar in southern New Jersey and in Delaware. You know, I think I read somewhere at some point that Delaware had been part of both Maryland and Pennsylvania. So how exactly did the English govern what we now know as Delaware? Well, Maryland tried to take over what became the lower three counties of Pennsylvania, but they tried, they wanted to, it didn't succeed. The lower three counties were really granted to Penn, and there were various iterations of trying to adjudicate that so that it could be more defined, and that didn't really get defined until independence. But Lord Baltimore and the heirs of William Penn, Thomas, and John Penn entered into an agreement in the early 1730s, and that was based on a faulty map leading to a Penn versus Baltimore case that dragged on for many years, was ruled in favor of Penn in 1750, and then it's that adjudication meant that brought in Mason and Dixon, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, the leading surveyors of the day from England, to survey the lines between 1763 and 1768. Interestingly enough, as I like to think of it, my work in Germantown has long connections with Delaware. One of the commissioners of the Mason and Dixon line was Benjamin Chu, who was a, an officer in Pennsylvania who owned many plantations in Delaware and Maryland. So it's all one story, as I like to think of it. But the royal approval of the boundaries is made official in 1769. But even so, that's not really the end. Some boundary stones were missing in the 1840s, where Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware together. There was a resurvey, and the new survey awarded small parts of Delaware to Pennsylvania and small parts of Maryland to Delaware. So it has moved and shifted over many ways. The way I like to think of it is there are three counties of Delaware that are very distinctive. In the south, near Maryland's southern peninsula, is the Sussex County. In the middle is Kent County, where Dover is. And in the north is Brandywine County. And in the north, around where that curve of the tip of Delaware is, that's the continental plain. That's the North American continent and the Appalachian Range. South of that is the Atlantic coastal plain. And that means that there's no field stone below that point. So the north and south of Delaware, there are good reasons why Maryland and Pennsylvania fought over this because the topography is different, that had differences in the economy in ways that are subtle to what are tidewater areas versus the long woods of the north in the industrial capacity versus the farming and the agricultural capacity of the south. All of it is related to waterways, but in the south it's more ocean and tidewater, and in the north it's more river-based. Speaking of these, I guess we could say different identities of Delaware, I'm curious about Delaware's identity as a colony. Many of its southern and western neighbors in Maryland came over as Catholics and grew tobacco, while many of its northern neighbors in New Jersey and Pennsylvania were Quakers who grew wheat. So where did Delaware and its people fit into all this? What was its identity like? Well, Delaware has always been a border state and a transitional state and has elements of both north and south, or the very things you've described, those distinctions between Pennsylvania and Maryland, and then there's a little mixture of both in Delaware. That's been the case since the colonial days. And, you know, the actual geographical divide is part of it, the Piedmont Plateau versus the Atlantic Coastal Plain. The climate's a bit warmer downstate. Growing season is about a week and a half longer. And there are important differences, cultural, economic, political, as well as religious. The northern is industrial, urban, agricultural, water power for industry. The southern is small town some manufacturing, but not a whole lot, very agricultural base. And that's from an early age. And that makes a big difference as the economies start to develop. But some of the earliest immigrants arrived in Delaware, and it's been diverse from beginning as that sort of transitional state. The ability of those economic differences still have long-lasting implications. 
it's long been blessed with ideal conditions to support thriving farms. So that's going to attract a variety of things, the rich soils, ample rainfall, a mild climate, reliable transportation to bigger markets like Philadelphia and Baltimore. For nearly 300 years, the wheat, peaches, and chickens have fed the nation, and 40% of Delaware's land is still used for agriculture, adding billions of dollars a year to the state. So from the early 1700s to the early 1800s, the northern parts of the state, farmers produced a lot of grains and everything, but they also used the rushing waters of the Brandywine Creek and other streams to power thriving flour mills producing hundreds of thousands of bushels of grain a year. The biggest mills were operated by a network of Quaker families in Brandywine Village, now part of Wilmington, and in Newport along Red Clay Creek. They could use the gravity of the falls to help power those mills. But meanwhile, in the South, peaches and canning became thriving industries very early. So there are many, how should I say, overlaid networks that allowed a fluidity of agricultural and industry above the canal, above the Chesapeake Canal, as well as below the canal. You know, all the British colonies in North America had a practice of slavery. So given Delaware's reliance on agriculture and its combination of northern and southern personalities, Glenn wonders if you could tell us a bit about Delaware's practice of slavery and whether Delaware followed a more northern practice of slavery or a more southern practice. Because of the rich soil and because of the way that many of the rules were skewed to help large plantation owners own land, many of the wealthy elite families of Maryland and Virginia and Pennsylvania owned large tracts of Delaware property like the Chews, the Ridgeleys, the Pens, and others. And therefore, they used plantation slave labor to farm those properties. Chu was the largest slave owner in certain periods. We have evidence of enslaved workers on Avery's Rest Plantation in the 1690s. So very early in the English settlement, there was plantation slavery. There were about 2,000 people enslaved at the time of the Civil War. And in Newcastle County, there were very few slaves by the Civil War. Most of the 2,000 were in the South. Kent and Sussex County being more more agricultural, there were more enslaved on those plantations. Some, like the Whitehall Plantation of Benjamin Chu, had only enslaved labor on it, and at that time, about 42 enslaved Africans. Interestingly, the influence of Quakers and increasing Methodism in the 1770s saw many people manumit their slaves and the growth of the Delaware Abolition Society. In that period, people like Warner Mifflin helped steer people to freedom through the manumission process. They also helped save people from being kidnapped and sold into enslavement further south, which was a big deal at the time, kidnapping and selling further south, particularly as the law started to change. So Warner Mifflin and John Dickinson freed his 30 some enslaved in 1777 while they were alive. And he was a signer of the Declaration. And I believe he's one of the few founding fathers who freed his enslaved population while he was still alive, which was very rare for a founding father. But Delaware has interesting distinctions in its plantation history. And some really good scholarship by people like Miles Stanley and Gary Nash is giving us a more rich picture of the social life. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. Because of the nature of the agriculture, it was harder to have labor-intensive farming make money. You didn't have cash-rich crops as viable in Delaware like tobacco or sugar or cotton because the climate didn't sustain it. The plantations had far fewer enslaved employees in Delaware than in southern states. So the vast majority of plantations had fewer than five enslaved in the 1700s compared to the majority in the South having at least five or 10 enslaved workers on it in much greater numbers. And as a result, that would mean that there were fewer enslaved and fewer families of enslaved. So the enslaved communities were disparate 
There wasn't as much intermarriage. If there was, that had to depend on being given permission or negotiating with owners for liberty to go to see wives on other plantations or family members on other plantations. And as a result, Delaware is a little bit disparate, diffused, and less populated an enslaved area than Maryland or Virginia or further south in, say, Georgia. And we're getting a richer sense of that through good scholarship and connecting dots of sources you might not expect to yield such dynamics of social life or kinship, and those would come from tax inventories and other property records. We've now talked a lot about the very early in colonial history of Delaware, but I think when many of us think about Delaware, we think about Delaware as the first state in the United States. David, how did Delaware become the first state? Well, let's be clear. It's the first state in some things and not in others. It's considered the first state because in 1787, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention ratified the Constitution. So that's where the nickname, the first state, comes from. Keep in mind that Delaware only ratified the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments in 1901. So it was not the first state in ratifying amendments that gave rights to former enslaved and to African Americans. So part of the complexity of Delaware's history is to look at some of those contradictions. First state, but only on some things. But meanwhile, Delaware had three delegates to the Constitutional Convention in July of 1776, Thomas McKean, George Reed, and Caesar Rodney. And they were instrumental in how they voted and didn't vote in certain cases about Delaware's independence. In June of 1776, Delaware had declared its independence from the crown, which made it its own colony. And the following month, it joined in the Declaration of Independence from the crown among the 13 colonies. So it had only been an independent colony for a matter of weeks before July 4th, 1776. But the first state nickname comes from 1787. And incidentally, the Articles of Confederation, the first constitution of the entire United States, as problematic as it was, was actually written by John Dickinson, in whose plantation is near Dover in Kent County. Well, Delaware certainly has an interesting history. And as we've heard throughout our conversation, it really does have multiple cultural, political, and economic traditions. Now, I wonder, David, given all that you know about Delaware and its history, What do you think the state's greatest contributions to United States history have been? A lot of people aren't aware of how exciting Delaware's contributions to American history are. And that's what excites me about my job, is bringing life to this very fascinating history. And I think it has its roots in how it has been a transitional and pass-through area for many different people, immigrants of all kinds. And I'll give you a couple of examples while noting that the museums, collections, and the archival collections of the Delaware Historical Society represent this diversity in many ways, unlike other museums in the area that may have you know, a wealthy family's private collection or one particular individual's collecting interest. Delaware Historical Society represents five centuries of incredibly diverse artifacts and documentary records. But among the things that give the immigration heritage of Delaware and its kind of salad bowl flavor go from things like the Avery's Rest Plantation has found new discoveries in the last 10 years about the archaeological record near Rehoboth Beach in Delaware in Sussex County. And a recent development in the last two or three years, has actually uncovered five individuals who worked on that plantation and the cultural resources of their archaeological records that are now in the Smithsonian. But it was a remarkable find of five individuals, including one 11-year-old boy, and they are likely of African descent. And the dendrochronology shows that, but to what degree, what roles they had, it may be one entire family five enslaved workers for John Avery's plantation. And we're only now getting to understand how rich and diverse the peopling of Delaware had been. When you consider that Delaware was a transition state in the 19th century, the implications of that are its contributions to the Underground Railroad. And Harriet Tubman is bringing hundreds and hundreds of people from the Eastern Shore through Delaware, particularly through Kent County, 
on up through Wilmington with help from people like Robert Purvis and Thomas Garrett and John Hun through Wilmington right there on 4th Street to get up into Bucks County, into Philadelphia, on up to Oswego and northern New York. So the Underground Railroad becomes one of that transition pass through elements of Delaware and people finding their way into America through their engagement with Delaware. One example that always intrigues me is that Bob Marley lived in Wilmington for several years in the early 1970s. In fact, in our collection, we have a phone book that lists his address and his occupation as musician. We have a reggae festival here at the Historical Society on the last weekend of every July, in part to celebrate the Jamaican American heritage of Delaware. So it goes on through with profound implications. And the thought that Bob Marley may have honed his craft as an incredible songwriter and reggae musician, in part because of the lively, Jamaican culture in Delaware is an interesting prospect to consider when we think about, well, what does Delaware contribute? And I think that goes to the point that Delaware has always been a home to a variety of immigrants who find their way into the American story. Now let's jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, what might have happened if Delaware had remained part of Maryland or Pennsylvania? How might the history of early America be different? That's a really good question. And, you know, counterfactuals are fun. And I think in some ways they're important. I think had Delaware not become its own independent state, its uniqueness would still have had to come out somehow. Because in one example, again, an immigrant coming into the region and making his or her way into the American story, look at the DuPonts who come into the Brandywine Valley in 1800 and use the topography of the falls and the streams of the Brandywine Creek to begin to make gunpowder based on formulas they had learned under the royal Bourbon dynasty in France. Well, had Delaware been not independent, that dynamic would still largely have happened because of the topography of those rivers. But of course, the DuPonts become not just this wealthy family, but this ginormous conglomerate of industry and chemicals with connections with General Motors. And we have a spacesuit in our collection because of the role of the DuPonts in the development of materials for the Apollo missions. And where I'm going with this is that that would have happened likely because of the Brandywine, no matter if Delaware were part of Pennsylvania, part of Maryland or not. So the uniqueness of its topography would still have likely have been at play. So I don't know that that really fits into a good counterfactual to answer your question. But that said, because Delaware found its own way to its own unique niche to capitalize on those kinds of resources, its commercial enterprise, its role in establishing its legacy is the corporate capital of America because so many corporations are incorporated in Delaware. That element of the commercial and legal heritage would also likely not have developed the same way had Delaware been in Pennsylvania, for instance, because how would that have competed with Pittsburgh or Philadelphia? That's hard to determine. And meanwhile, the judicial legacies of Delaware are different from Pennsylvania and Maryland, which had important implications with how segregated the school system was. And that might not have been the case had Delaware still been in Pennsylvania, which had you know, adopted a public school system far earlier than many other states had. For instance, in Philadelphia, it's as early as the 1840s. Delaware did nothing like that until people really pressed to have public education in the uh, early 1900s. It was really in pockets and private and mostly religious-based. So that might not have taken the shape it had, and that would have been a positive had Delaware's very, very segregated education legacy had other national influences or different kinds of, how should I say, diverse features that may have been the case in Maryland and Pennsylvania 
but not the case in Delaware. So, David, how can we visit the Delaware Historical Society? And does the society have any special exhibits or exhibitions coming up that we should know about? Well, the Delaware Historical Society has two campuses, one in downtown Wilmington. Our library and museum straddle Market Street, which is the commercial corridor of downtown Wilmington with lots of restaurants. You can get here by Amtrak and walk from the Frank Furness Design Station right up to Fifth and Market with some beautiful built architecture passing by things like the Harriet Tubman and Thomas Garrett Public Square and other features of the built environment. We also have a campus in Newcastle. Historic Newcastle is a wonderful gem of colonial and revolutionary era buildings, remarkably preserved. The Reed House is right on the Delaware. It's a beautiful National Historic Landmark. There are only 14 National Historic Landmarks in Delaware, and the Reed House, the George Reed II House, is the most recent, only designated so in 2017. It's right on the Delaware River on the Strand in Newcastle, and it's one of the most beautiful buildings in the country. We have many programs throughout the year. We run National History Day for the state of Delaware. That's coming up. And we've received a couple of remarkable collections recently that are going to be coming on display in the fall through the Paul Preston Davis collection. But meanwhile, our exhibits are as exciting as you're ever going to see. The stuff of Delaware history is phenomenal. We'll be restoring a battle flag from the revolution, the Danzy flag, in August, and you'll be able to come in and see how that goes. Our rare books, our rare photos, our original newspapers and yearbooks are all readily accessible. But you can best see the exciting work that we're doing with our social media feeds on Instagram. Check out Reed House and Gardens or at Delaware Historical Society. Check out The Vault on Instagram because we bring out new exciting things from our collections that way. We have a remarkable collection of the diverse history of Delaware, and that speaks to the diverse history of America. Now, if we have questions about the early history of Delaware, how can we contact you or someone else at the Delaware Historical Society to ask about them? The best way to do so is to check out our website, which is dehistory.org, and ask Caesar. Ask Caesar is our search database portal, and it allows you to ask some questions about what's in our collections or research queries. Ask Caesar refers to asking Caesar Rodney, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. But dehistory.org, stay tuned because there's a lot of things to be excited about in Delaware history. I've been nine months in the job, and there are just some really fascinating local history projects going on throughout the state. And it'll be our job to connect them with one another and then to connect them with the nation at large, because we believe that the exciting history of Delaware is not yet fully on the public history map of the United States. David Young, thank you for introducing us to the Delaware Historical Society and for taking us through some different aspects of Delaware's early history. It's been a pleasure, and I really love your podcast, and I appreciate your involving public history in our exploration of colonial American history. The Delaware Historical Society was founded in 1864 to preserve, explore, share, and promote Delaware's history, heritage, and culture. Now, as David mentioned, this is a history encompassed in part by the Historical Society's manuscript and artifact collections, which, all told, could take us back five centuries into Delaware's past. Now, it's within these collections that we'll find information about Delaware's first inhabitants, the Lenape and Nanticoke peoples, where we'll find information about its first European settlers, the Swedish and Dutch, and where we'll also find information about Delaware's quest to define itself as apart from Maryland and Pennsylvania and as a part of both the North and South. Now, as David revealed, it's Delaware's existence as a transitional state that has made it such a big part of the United States and such a rich place for us to study how Americans have interacted with and embraced the great diversity of North America. Delaware is really a place where we can study Native American communities and cultures, European rivalries, the development of plantation and non-plantation-based agricultural systems, and differing ideas about slavery, American independence, and how the new United States should move forward. Delaware may be a really small state. In fact, it's the second smallest state in the United States. But it has always had a big, complex history. A history that can really show us a lot about the early American past. For more information about David and the Delaware Historical Society, 
plus notes for everything we talked about today, check out the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 242. Ben Franklin's World has a new shop, so show the world that you're a fan and listener of this podcast with a new Ben Franklin's World t-shirt, tote bag, or hoodie. Plus, any day now, we'll have limited edition designs that will help you commemorate and celebrate the 4th of July. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash shop. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, the highest compliment you can pay it is to tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, have you visited the Delaware Historical Society? If so, I'd love to know about your visit. I'd also love to know what other historical societies you'd like to learn more about. So please send me your answers. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.